Docker is a great tool, but it can be confusing to get started with. This series is on using Docker for robotics, but this video is actually going to be pretty general. We're going to get Docker set up and we're going to run some containers for ourselves. If you haven't watched the last video yet, I'd encourage you to start there to make sure you understand what Docker is and some of the key concepts and also why we would want to use it for robotics. You can use the chapter markers to skip to wherever you need to, but basically we're going to install Docker, download an image, run it as a container, customize that image with our own Docker file, and finally we're going to run that custom container with access to our own files. Also, this video is sponsored by PCBWay, more on them later. Obviously, the first thing we're going to have to do is to actually install Docker. Now, what you don't want to do is type sudo apt install docker. That's actually going to install a completely unrelated program. You can install docker.io, but we're actually going to do it a different way that is the way recommended by the Docker developers. I'm going to head over to this web page. I'll include the link up on the screen. Uh, and even within this page, there's a whole lot of different options. What we're going to do is we're going to jump down to install using the convenience script. So this is basically a little script that's going to do all of the things that uh, were above this on the page. We're going to start by running this line. This is actually going to download the script for us. If you haven't got curl installed, you've got to make sure you install it first. So if we have a look, that's downloaded the file. Now we could take a look inside that and check that we're happy with what it's doing, but fair warning, it's pretty complicated. Uh, and then what we can do is run this without the dry run to install Docker. Okay, once it's finished, we're not actually quite finished yet. Uh, by default, Docker runs as root, which is inconvenient for us. Instead, we're going to do some post install steps. You can find them here. Uh, but basically, what we're going to do, we're going to start by uh, adding the Docker group with sudo group add docker. It already exists. Uh, then we can add the user to this group with sudo user mod dash ag docker user. And then you've got to log out and log back in to apply these changes. I'm actually just going to reboot, but I'll do that in a minute. First, I want to confirm that the Docker service is enabled with systemctl is enabled docker. And that's great. Uh, I'll put the, up on the screen the command to run to enable it if it isn't already enabled. So that's great. Let's reboot. Now that we've rebooted, we can type docker run hello world to run our first container. And there we go, we've run our first container. Now that one was pretty boring, but we'll do some more interesting stuff soon. As we just saw, the way that we interact with Docker is by using the docker base command and then a child command, which can have its own commands. This is very similar to ROS2 with ROS2 run, ROS2 launch, and so on. Now, if you ever look through the full list of these, you'll find that it's very long and some of the functions are actually doubled up. There's often a long version and then a shortcut. The two main commands that we'll be learning about in the next few minutes are docker image, which lets us interact with images, and docker container, which, you guessed it, lets us interact with containers. The first command is docker image ls, or just the shortcut docker images. This will list all of the images on our system, and for now, we just have the hello world one, so let's add some more. We can use docker image pull to download an image from a registry. Now the default registry is Docker Hub, but you can change that if you need to. We're going to be working with the ROS Humble image. So we're going to type Docker image pull ROS Humble. The bit before the colon is the image name, also called the repository. And the bit after the colon is the tag, or kind of like the version. So in this case, we want the ROS image version humble. Now we can run Docker images again, and we'll see our new image we just downloaded is there. A few other tips, if you leave the version off, it'll just try to get the latest one. If you try to run an image without pulling it first, it'll pull it automatically. That's what happened earlier on when we ran Hello World. And as a shortcut, you can just type docker pull instead of docker image pull. And just in case you mess things up and you need to delete an image, we can do that with docker image rm or docker rmi. So I could go docker image rm hello world. But what you'll find is that if you've ever run a container from it before, even if it's stopped, it's not going to let you delete it. Now you can actually go through and manually get rid of that container first, but it's often quicker to just add dash f for force. And there we go. Now it has deleted the hello world image from our system. To actually run our image as a container, we can do docker container run or as a shortcut docker run. So let's go docker run ros humble. 
And what happened? Nothing. By default, Docker will run a command in the container and once it finishes, it quits. If you're using this to deploy the final software on your robot, this is exactly what you want. You'd set it up to run the software when the whole container starts up and then stop the container once the software finishes. But for development and for poking around inside the container, we want to access a terminal. So to do that, we're going to go docker run and then we're going to add the I and T flags, which stand for interactive and TTY, which just means give me a terminal that I can type in. So docker run dash IT Ross Humble. So now we've got a terminal running and I can type commands in it. I'm just going to create a file called AAAA uh, with the touch command. So if I type ls, we can see that that file is now there. And then over in a new tab, we can run docker container ls or docker ps as a shortcut. I'll just make the terminal a little bit bigger. And this helpfully tells us that our container is running, it's been up for 24 seconds, and it's also given us this weird auto-generated name, loving bore. To stop our container, we can send a quit signal with control D, or we can type quit, or we can use docker container stop, and then the name of the container. So in this case, loving bore. With interactive containers, we'll usually use the first method, but if it's running off on its own, we'll stop it with the command. So back in the other tab, we can see now we no longer have the, the root prompt there. So it's stopped. And if we go back to this one and run docker ps, remember that's the shortcut for container ls, it's not there anymore, it's gone. What's sometimes helpful is we can add the dash a flag to this, and this will tell us all containers, even if they've stopped. So there we can see uh, that's the one that we just ran. Then here's the one we ran that died straight away. And then here is our hello world from earlier. We can actually start our old container back up again with docker container start. Uh, we're not going to use IT this time, just I is all we need. And then the name of our container, so loving bore. And we should see we're back in there. There's our AAA file. We're back in our container. I'll exit that now with control D and I'll just swap back to this tab and I want to look at what happens if we run it again. So we're going to rerun again, docker run IT Ross Humble. So there we go, we've got another prompt, it looks kind of the same, but if we ls, that AAAA isn't there anymore and if we docker ps, we can see we've now got a new container running with a new name, this time it's Goofy Allen. So it's gotten rid of our old one, it would still be there in the stopped ones but the new one has kind of overtaken it. Over time, you're gonna build up a few containers in this list and we can get rid of them one by one with docker container rm. So we could do uh, loving or from before and we can delete that. Uh, but that gets a bit tedious. We can actually get rid of all the stop ones at once by doing docker container prune. Oh, and it helps if we spell docker correctly. So it says, warning, this will remove all stop containers. Are you sure you want to continue? And now if we docker ps-a, all of our stopped ones are gone. It's just that one that we've got here that's still running. A few tips for running containers. For starting and stopping, you can just drop the word container and type docker start and docker stop. Rather than deleting your container manually afterwards, by using the dash dash rm argument when you run it, you can have it delete automatically when it's done. And you can also name your container with dash dash name. So that makes it easier to remember the name for starting and stopping rather than getting those random auto-generated ones. And finally, Docker Run has like a billion optional arguments and many of them can't be changed once you have the container running. That's things like network settings and passing through hardware devices. We're gonna look at some of those in the next video. So we've got our container running inside a terminal here, but it's just one terminal. What if we want more? Now you can totally run multiple copies of the same image at once and each one is gonna get their own container and that's often a good option, that's what you want. But other times we specifically do want to open a new terminal inside the same container. And for that we use docker exec. Once again, we wanna use the dash i and dash t flag. So docker exec dash i t and then the name of the container. So in this case, it's goofy allen. And then finally the command we want to run and we just want a terminal to interact with so we'll run slash bin slash bash. So now we can see we've got another terminal in this same container. I can create a file and if we go back to that first tab we can see that new file that I just created using this terminal is going to be there. So we've got two terminals in the one container. 
Another way we can use exec is to run a single command inside a container. So instead of running slash bin slash bash, I can tell it to just run ls inside the container. And you can see it's executing it and we get that bbbb file that we created in there. There's so much more we can do with these Docker commands, but we need to move on for now. Because you see, this is a good start, but there are two things that are limiting the usability for us. Firstly, we lose any changes that we made to the environment every time we run the container. And secondly, we have no way to get our own files and data in there. We're gonna see how to solve both of these problems in just a minute, but first a word from the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. PCBWay is an online service for prototyping and developing custom hardware. As the name suggests, they offer a range of PCB manufacturing services, including single and multi-layer, rigid and flexible, even assembling components and more. It doesn't stop there though. PCBWay also offers CNC machining, 3D printing, injection molding, and sheet metal fabrication, giving you all the tools you need to turn your ideas into reality. To find out more, head over to the PCBWay website using the link in the description. The way that we make permanent changes to an image is by creating our own image that's based on it. And we do that with a Docker file. So let's create a new directory. I'm gonna call it uh, my project. And I'm gonna open this in VS Code. And in here, we're gonna create a Docker file. So we just create a new file and call it Docker file. May as well install the extension. There are a bunch of different instructions that we can put in our Docker file and they're gonna tell Docker what to do. But in this video, we're just gonna use a few of them. The first instruction is always from, and this tells us which image we wanna start from. You see, in practice, we always wanna start from something else. And this base image can be something really simple like Alpine Linux. It's only got the bare essentials and it's only three megabytes up to something like the ROS images, which come with many different libraries and programs bundled in. For our example, let's base it on the ROS Humble image. So we're gonna type from ROS Humble. Okay, that's a great start. Maybe now we wanna run some commands. The thing we probably wanna do more often than anything else in our Docker files is to install things. This could be from source or from somewhere else, but for many packages on an Ubuntu or a Debian base, we're gonna be doing this through apt. Now you might be used to running apt and other commands with sudo, but in a Docker container, everything runs as root, so we don't need to use sudo. Sometimes we actually wanna specifically not run things as root, but we'll save that for a future video. So what sort of things might you wanna install? It's gonna depend on your project, obviously, but remember that these Docker images are often really stripped down and don't even come with a text editor. I like to use nano, so that's gonna be our example. To run commands like apt, we use the run instruction. Now, you might have a few questions about this line. It looks a little bit different to how you would normally run apt. It's a bit complicated to explain right now. We're gonna be dealing with that in the next video. You just need to accept that what this line is gonna do is use apt to install nano. Of course, you can also use the run instruction to run any other command that you could run in a terminal. Another thing we'll often wanna do is to copy some of our own custom files into the image. This could be the software that we're wanting to run, some custom dependencies, some configuration files, whatever. Keep in mind that whatever we put in here will then be stuck as part of the image. We can't change it easily without rebuilding. To do this, we use the copy instruction. Now, Docker also has a very similar instruction called add, but it does some funny things. So unless you know that you really need to be using it, you shouldn't. As a simple example, Let's say I had a config directory in here and then a file in there called myconfig.yaml and that had something in it. Now let's say I want these important configuration files to be burned into the image and I need them to be in a directory in the root called siteconfig. I'm gonna type copy config. So that's gonna take the config directory and then copy it to site config. So that's going to take the config directory and copy it into the root of the image at slash site config. You can tweak this for relative paths, files, folders, all that sort of thing. So we'll save that and now we can have a go at building and running our image. To build it, we want to type uh, docker image build. So let's get into the directory where we had that. We'll type, so there's our docker file. We'll type docker image build. You can also just use docker build as a shortcut. And now we almost always wanna give a name for our image. So we use the dash T for this and I might call it 
my image. And then finally, the path to the Docker file, which at the moment is the current directory I'm in. So we just use dot to say that. So we do this, it's gonna step through what it's doing. So we can see it is uh, running apt and installing nano. And then it copied our config directory and then saved it and named it my image. So now we can use Docker images to check our list of images. And look, our new image is there. Isn't that great? And it's ever so slightly bigger than the ROS image that we based it on, which makes sense. Now we can use docker run dash it my image to spin up a container. And if we type ls, we can see our site config directory there. And we can even edit the files in that directory with nano. Isn't that great? For actually deploying a final system, this is great. We can fill up our image with everything it needs to operate and it's good to go. But sometimes we also want to share some files from our host computer to the container. The classic example of this is for development. You've got some code that you're working on, you want to store it somewhere on your computer in a persistent location that you can access, and then have the Docker container sort of start up around it and also be able to access those files. There are two main ways that Docker handles files that persist between runs or even between containers of different images. They're officially called volumes and bind mounts, but even Docker itself sometimes mixes that language around and calls them all mounts or calls them all volumes. For classic Docker applications like web servers and databases, volumes are often the best way to go. They're like a shared virtual drive that you can't easily access from outside Docker, but you can make it available to any containers that need it. For most of the applications that I've used though, bind mounts are more helpful. In the example before of development, we can simply mount the directory with our source code into the container and voila, our files are there to be accessed. In fact, let's do that right now. So here I've made another directory on the desktop called my code. Inside that, there's another directory called source. And I want to make this source directory available inside the container as my source code. So I'm going to open up the terminal here inside the container and type docker run dash it like before. Now, there are a few different ways that we can specify a mount. The simplest is to just use dash v. Then the path on the host, and then a colon, and then the path inside the container. But you should be aware that both of these need to be absolute paths. So to get the path of the current directory, we type uh, pwd, uh, so that's print working directory. So that'll get us the current directory, and then we want slash source. So that's that source directory that's in there then the colon, and then I want that mounted inside the container as my source code. Finally, then we put the name of our image, so my image, hit enter. And now if we type ls, we can see we've got my source code directory here. So if we get into my source code, you can see there's a file that I created before. Now I can create a new file here called new file YAML, punch something in there. And now if we open up the my code directory in the browser and source, we'll see there's our new file. So we've created that inside the container and it's back available in our host. But you notice something weird here and that's this lock. So if we get back out of this and type, uh, get into source, type ls-la, we can see here that the new file is owned by root and that's a bit of a problem that we get. Uh, our inside our Docker container is running as root, so it's creating files as root, and then they're not owned by the user out here and we can't open them properly. We're gonna see how to fix this in the next video. Congratulations, you've just made your first Docker image and you've run it and you've got your own files in there. This is the tip of a very big iceberg. So in the next video, we're gonna cover some other common use cases that are a little bit more advanced. So this is gonna be things like setting up network connections, running graphical programs, and changing users and running sudo inside Docker. Thanks again to PCBWay, and also to all the patrons over at Patreon for supporting me in running this channel. If you have any questions about the stuff from this video, in the description you'll find a link to the corresponding discussion thread over at the Articulated Robotics discussion forum, as well as some other good stuff. All right, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.